of Odenak, uh, what is called today Odenak, and I'll be the MC for this uh, side event this afternoon. So um, uh, thank you for being here and part of this, uh, this side event is part of the 23rd session of the United Nations uh, Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues uh, at the UN headquarters here in New York City. I'm delighted to see many of you here present for this event. Again, for those of you in the room, Spanish interpretation is available. So I'll explain uh, in a few minutes how the event will be uh, going. But first, we'd like to start off with a welcome song, uh, an Abenaki welcome song. Uh, so I'll invite uh, Martin, Jacques, and uh, Isaac in front. Uh, as for an outline of this event, we'll start, uh, we start off with a few words from uh, Regional Chief Ghislaine Picard, Chief of the Assembly of First Nations of Quebec and Labrador, followed by a few words from Chief Rick Obamsawin of the Abenaki of Odenak Nation. Chief Picard. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good, uh, very uh, delighted to, to, to be part of this uh, very important event. Uh, uh, side event uh, this week at the UN. Uh, not, not my first side event, uh, but nevertheless uh, uh, an item of discussion that is very important and uh, I think it's uh, becoming more and more a concern for many of our nations. Uh, I have the privilege and, and pleasure to, to be leading a table of chiefs of nations within my own region of Quebec and Labrador. Uh, 43 uh, uh, First Nation governments uh, within within that uh, uh, within that table, uh, ten different nations, and uh, I'm glad to say that I'm first off a member of the Ino Nation, which is one of the ten nations of Quebec and Labrador, uh, closely affiliated with the Abenaki Nation. We come from the same line of uh, Algonquin families. Uh, which uh, strides uh, from east to west, uh, probably all the way to the Rockies, Canadian Rockies. And uh, 
Uh, and one of the issues that comes to our table uh, uh, more often than not is the issue of uh, identity and uh, who belongs to which nation. Uh, this, amongst many other items uh, of discussion, of concern, uh, pertaining to our relationship with the Canadian state and uh, our, our nations. Uh, I also have the uh, opportunity and privilege to raise uh, concerns with other national organizations, indigenous organizations, organizations within Canada. As a matter of fact, uh, back in, uh, uh, in March, March 19th, uh, I, was, uh, uh, I was at a press conference in Ottawa along with uh, the national president of uh, ITK, Inuit Takrimit uh, 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 Kanatomy, uh, President uh, Nathan Obed, uh, to uh, challenge the claims of some groups within the area of Labrador, uh, claiming to be of uh, Inuit uh, 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 claiming, uh, claiming Inuit identity. And uh, this is only one uh, uh, part of a larger reality where groups are coming and presenting themselves as member of nations uh, without any kind of uh, legitimacy. And uh, the irony is that uh, that group had a side event at this uh, UN forum just this morning. And uh, as a matter of fact, I received a message from our leadership within the Inu Nation, uh, uh, sisters and brothers from the Inu Nation of Labrador, uh, stating that this should be raised as, a, as an issue of concern. So uh, I do my due diligence and, and raise that point uh, on their behalf. Uh, this being said, at the same time, we also have to, as, this, as if this wasn't enough, we also have to uh, question uh, a number of actions taken by the Canadian government, in this case, uh, which uh, has, uh, has been pushing for the past uh, number of months and weeks a bill before Parliament, Bill 53. In this case, uh, uh, recognizing rights or pro uh, proposing to recognize rights for the an organization called the Métis Nation of Ontario. And there again, there are concerns raised by, raised by nations uh, from both Ontario and the Quebec uh, uh, side, uh, not about the legitimacy of the group itself, but uh, the legitimacy of what they claim. And when we say that uh, identity or identity fraud uh, presents a risk for uh, the integrity of our nations. It also presents a risk for the integrity of our traditional territories. So these, these are the points uh, being raised uh, at this uh, specific side event. The issue has been raised by the Abenaki Nation and uh, Chief of Bamsawi a number of times uh, 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 throughout the years. And uh, this is coming to uh, a situation where not only do we have to uh, state those points to uh, very important points to Canada, but we also have made those, uh, those lobbying efforts uh, in the U.S. as well, as stated by Chief Obamsar in earlier on. So I, I think uh, uh, we certainly uh, definitely are in support of the actions taken by the Abenaki Nation or any other nation that uh, uh, might see... Uh, a danger to their integrity as nations. And ultimately, uh, we say that uh, despite the fact that uh, there's at least one article of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that in a way uh, gives the freedom for anyone to claim an indigenous identity, uh, I think ultimately it really belongs to our nations to exercise that right and jurisdiction. So I'll leave it to uh, Chief Obamsawin to present their case uh, regarding uh, the, the, their own nation. I thank you all for coming today. I sit before you here to, dis win, to show you a presentation of what our nation is going through. I hold in my hand three strings of wampum. In our tradition, this represents we come to you with the truth. We come to you with clear eyes open ears, 
and we will speak the truth today. This subject that we're going to speak of might look like it affects my nation. This subject is coming for all nations. As just Lane said, although the UN Declaration states that self-recognition is allowed, does it say that it's allowed for someone to steal our culture, our language, our way of life, and our history? Rewrite the stories. Worse than that, they even come to us to steal our pain. The pain that our ancestors and our, our parents before us have gone through. They will steal our future generations. This must be stopped. The UN must rewrite what they've said. It is not good enough to say that you have the right to self-recognize and all you have to do is have someone else recognize you. This recognition belongs to our nations and only to our nations. We know who our people are. We know what we've been through. We know how much we've suffered. And we know the future of our families and the future of our people. Only we have the right to recognize our people. Thank you. Uh, Picard and Chief Obamsman, thank you. So uh, that's a good uh, setup to uh, the side event that will take place. Now uh, we will have a, a couple of presentations. The first one will be done by Daryl LaRue. Uh, Mr. LaRue is Associate Professor at the School of Political Studies at uni the University of Ottawa. He will explain the context and origins of identity fraud, a phenomenon that exists in many countries around the world. And afterwards, we'll be following with a presentation by two Ab young Abenaki speakers that will be explaining how identity fraud affects our nation, particularly uh, regarding our fundamental, I'm sorry, uh, right to self-determination. -determina so, and finally, at the end, we'll take questions from uh, the ground, uh, and uh, we'll be uh, staying a little longer uh, to talk to uh, anyone who wants to speak further on this matter. So I would like at this point to invite uh, Mr. Darrell LaRue to come forward. So I think I'll, I'll, oh, oh. I'll sit here. Okay. Can people hear me? If I'm too close or if I move back and you can't hear me, please just let me know. Um, so I'll just give a bit of a, an overview of um, this sort of issue of quote unquote identity fraud and then speak specifically to the um, fake Abenaki tribes in Vermont and New Hampshire, but particularly in Vermont. Um, uh, so basically since the 1970s, there's been an increasing number of white Americans who have been claiming um, that they are Native American. Um, the social movement has been called uh, playing Indian, race shifting, self-indigenization, or pretendianism more recently. Uh, it really depends on um, who's talking about it, which scholars or academics or which community members. <clears throat> There's some examples of some individuals. Um, yeah, if we can go to the next slide. One of the sort of ways in which we can measure this is through the U.S. Census. Uh, in 1960, there were 552,000 individuals who identified themselves as Native American in the census. Um, and that, that number had remained relatively stable. So it was increasing. It wasn't increasing um, at a very large rate, but it was increasing at a normal demographic rate. In 2020, so 60 years later, it was at 9.7 million people. Um, that's not due to births, obviously. That's due to people shifting into new identities. Um, and so you could see that rate of growth uh, actually outstrips the rate of growth of the United States almost 10 times during this period. And so the Native American population goes from a relatively stable um, population as recorded in the census to one that um, increases exponentially basically every 10 years in the census from 1960s on. You see the change really start in 1970. Um, next slide, please. Um, so basically one of the explanations for this that uh, sociologists in, part in particular have come up with is that uh, white Americans have, uh, especially since the civil rights movement and the ways in which there were public calls for accountability and perhaps even reparations for racial violence, uh, white Americans have sought ways to escape white identities or their whiteness, I guess you can say. Uh, one group of white Americans recast themselves as white ethnic minorities. Um, and so you can think about uh, people, especially who are the descendants of immigrants to the United States in the late 1800s. So people who are the descendants of Irish folks, Polish folks, 
um, you know, uh, Jewish people from Eastern Europe, etc., they started to um, hyphenate their identities and really sort of differentiate themselves from the white sort of majority. Um, so you have this sort of development of these organizations that are meant to represent Irish Americans and Italian Americans, and Hollywood becomes a part of that. They sort of start celebrating those particular ethnic minority identities. Um, and then you also have a group, those who were um, the descendants of earlier immigrants, or um, I guess you could say colonizers to the United States, who um, start to imagine themselves as Native American. Um, and so that uh, leads to hundreds of new fake Cherokee tribes in the United States. In particular, Cherokee tends to be the identity that is stolen the most often. And there are a variety of historical reasons that we can discuss if you'd like for that. Um, but there are also other ways in which people identify themselves. So, so at this point, there are thousands of these fake Native American organizations in the United States. Um, Sometimes these claims are based on long ago ancestors. Uh, you know, you can go back to the early sort of um, pilgrims, if you will, or even um, in sort of Virginia and think about um, specific ancestors in someone's family tree and using that ancestor to shape one's identity. A lot of the times, though, it's based specifically on family lore. So these stories that circulate in families, um, particularly white families who no longer want to be white or associated with white sort of power or white supremacy, and they start to imagine themselves as Native American and their story about their family changes. Um, it's, uh, Native American tribes have been very clear that they oppose this movement um, uh, in a variety of different public statements and also court cases and other efforts where they've uh, sort of led the charge against these types of claims. Um, and one of the major critiques is that indigenous identity is not primarily uh, or only about blood. And so finding a long ago ancestor is not what makes one indigenous today. Um, and so I'm just going to, that was a very brief overview of this quite large social movement that has led almost 10 million Americans to identify themselves as Native American. But I'm going to focus here more, more carefully on Vermont. So there are four um, so-called Abenaki tribes that received state recognition in 2011 and 2012. State recognition is something that really started to take off at the same time as this movement takes off in the 1960s and particularly the 70s and 80s. And so uh, states start to adopt these state recognition processes. Um, and so I did a, this paper here that I wrote that is available, uh, it's open access online. It's in the uh, American Indian Culture and Research Journal. Um, and so my research showed that the individuals who are um, members of these so-called tribes are actually descendants of uh, Quebecois or French Canadian immigrants to the state of Vermont, um, essentially from the 1810s to the 1880s. But um, you know the mean year is about 1845. Um, so that's a, a movement that was quite um, common. Uh, Quebecois people migrated to New England en masse. About 750,000 people from Quebec moved to New England um, in the 1800s up until about 1910. Um, and this includes the uh, ancestors of these individuals who have remade themselves into the Abenaki. Um, so they're not actually Abenaki people. Uh, they don't descend from Ag Abenaki people. They have no kin kinship ties with the Abenaki people at Odenak or Wolanak, who some of whom are here with you today. Um, but they're treated as such in Vermont law, um, which means that, uh, actually, we can go to the next slide. Um, all right, I'll get back to that. But uh, they can basically um, make arts uh, uh, legally under the law in the United States now. Um, they can do a number of other things that I'll get to in a moment through this legal recognition. Um, and so if you can go to the next slide. They um, actually failed at getting federal recognition in 2006. Um, and the state of Vermont actually opposed them. But uh, just a few years later, um, they recognized them through a process that was really problematic. And so I just highlight here some of the problems with that process. Um, they are full of conflicts of interest, and they actually barred the participation of actual Abenaki people. Part of the way they did that is by saying that they're Canadians, and so they shouldn't be allowed in the United States making decisions about who's indigenous in the United States. So that international border has actually infringed on the Abenaki people's sovereignty in very um, uh, problematic and harmful ways. 
Um, and so, you know, one of the reasons that this works out is because for state legislators, whether they're um, <clears throat> members of the House or the Senate, uh, you know, if they can get a few thousand people in a particular uh, region of Vermont to vote for them by giving them recognition, then that becomes a political calculation that might be useful. Um, <clears throat> one of the things, too, about the process is it never actually verified whether these are the descendants of Abenaki people. It took their word um, and then never actually followed through on it. Um, so uh, one thing, one other thing that, or a few things that my research demonstrated was that um, these sort of fake quote unquote tribes, they generally only receive support in states um, with no federally recognized Native American tribes. So uh, in the paper that I wrote, uh, of the eight states that have the largest population proportion of Native Americans in the census, but also the largest proportion of federally recognized Native American tribes, none of them have a state recognition process. And that's because those tribes have opposed the state having that sort of power. Um, <clears throat> so I, I give the example in the paper of a similar effort to the, these Abenaki tribes in Vermont that occurred in Maine in the 2000s, uh, where this group who were the descendants of Acadians or French Canadians from the East Coast um, they, tr they sort of actually managed to convince the Maine legislature that they were Native Americans. They got um, sort of free hunting and fishing licenses. But once there was a bill to sort of, uh, they, they could access free state tuition and stuff like that, the four federally recognized tribes in Maine uh, mobilized and opposed um, the legislation and they actually won. And so this tribe um, still calls them, this group still calls themselves a tribe, but they have no recognition by the state of Maine. Um, all right, next slide. Um, so these are some of the things that these, uh, these fake sort of tribes can now do. They're entrusted with human remains for reburial, so uh, at construction sites and other um, sites in Vermont, if um, there are human remains that are discovered, they are not returned to the uh, Abenaki people, but they're returned to these fake tribes, and they get to rebury them, um, you know, conduct ceremonies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they receive funding for social programs. Uh, they receive some federal funding because they're state recognized. They rewrite education curriculum. They're quite involved with the state sort of education um, system and with teachers. Uh, they also run the state's Commission on Native American Affairs, which ensures that um, their members and their recognition is never put into question. They have access to free hunting and fishing licenses, and they also have property tax exemptions for their buildings. Um, their members can also legally produce and market Native American art under the federal legislation because that federal legislation that was passed in 1995, the Native American Arts and Crafts Law Act, Act, thank you, Jaco, um, it actually makes an exception for state recognized tribes. So in this case, um, they have, I think it's between 50 and 100 people who are part of their Abenaki Alliance of uh, Artists Alliance and they make uh, art for the entire um, sort of New England market and are legally able to sell it. Um, and so despite marked opposition by the Abenaki who are here with us today, um, they continue to benefit from state recognition. Uh, next week, um, a number of us are going to Vermont and having, we're doing a presentation at the University of Vermont. And it's uh, the third in a series of three, if I'm not mistaken, that has taken place. So there um, has been some education that's been done in Vermont about these groups. Uh, and there has been some support, but in terms of, um, you know, undoing the state recognition, I think we're still a long way away. Um, thank you. Professor LaRue. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that uh, he, for the past decade, he has been studying the social, political, and legal dynamics that have led to people to, in the U.S. and Canada to claim indigenous identity. He also wrote a book, Distorted Descent, Who White Claims to Indigenous Identity, that was published in 2019 and translated into French in 2022. Thank you. So now I'd like to invite uh, uh, speakers, uh, Siguanis uh, Lachapelle and Isaac Lachapelle-Gil uh, to make their presentation. For the reference, they're cousins. <laughs> 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 
We are cousins, yes. <laughs> For the record. Kwai, and Dalewese, Isaac La Chapelle Gil, Anon Banea, and Wege Odanak, Nesinska, Taba, Yao, and Kasgadma. Negawes, Alezuezeo, Patricia La Chapelle, Wegawesa, Dolores Womanolet, Ta, Ometongwesa, Ernest La Chapelle. Nemetongwes, Martin Gil, Wegawesa, Ellen Gil, Ta, Owet, Ometamagwesa, Michel Gil. Kwai, hello everyone. My name is Isaac Le Chapelle Gill. I'm an Abenaki from Odenak. I'm 24 years old. My mother is Patricia La Chapelle. Her mother is Dolores Wawanalet. And her father is Ernest La Chapelle. My father is Martin Gill. And his mother is Ellen Gill. And his father is Michel Gill. Okay. Kwai, and Dalewezi Siguanis, La Chapelle, and Dal Nomba Esqua, Ta Polebe, Inwege Odanak, Nessis Kataba, and Guadans and Kasaganma, Negawes Alewezo Joan La Chapelle, Wegawesa Dolores Wawanolet, Ta Ometongwesa Ernest La Chapelle, and Mitongwes Rodrigo Brinkhaus, Wegawesa Norma Brinkhaus, Ta Ometongwesa Eduardo Brinkhaus. Eduardo. Eduardo. <laughs> um, so, hello, hi, my name is Siguanis Achapel. It means little spring in the Abenaki language. Um, I'm, I'm Abenaki, and I'm also Bolivian. Uh, I live in Odenak. I'm 26 years old. Uh, my mother's name is Joanne Lachapelle. Uh, her mother's name is Dolores Wawanolet, uh, and her father is uh, Ernest Lachapelle. My father is uh, Rodrigo Brinkhaus, uh, his mother is Norma Brinkhaus, and his father is Eduardo Brinkhaus. Um, it's with some tre uh, trepidation, but above all, a great deal of pride that we speak out today on behalf of our people, the Wabanaki Nation. We do so in defense of our identity and our rights as stipulated in Articles 3 and 4 of the UNDRIP, which are currently being trampled underfoot. In recent years, there has been a significant increase in the number of people who, because of family lore or a distant 17th century uh, ancestors, suddenly declare themselves to be of our nation. This raises a significant question. Who can say they belong to our nation? We are aware that because of government laws and policies, many of our people lost their status or family ties and now aspire to reconnect with their culture and community. We welcome their their efforts to reconnect with us. Every indigenous community has faced similar hardships related to identity and belonging. There is a legacy of resilience passed down from generations to generations. In Canada, issues of reconne re uh, reconnecting, uh, sorry, reconnection exists mainly because of the Canadian government policy and the Indian Act as a, a piece of legislation aimed at the assimilation of indigenous people. Many of the people who belong to our nation today are indeed descendants of people, uh, especially women who were impacted by the Canadian government's racist legis legislation and colonial policies. But beyond these people who can leg legitimately call, call themselves members of our nation, there are uh, more and more people who call themselves Abenaki on the sole pretext of family lore or a distant, distant ancestor from over 300 years ago. However, there is a fundamental, fundamental distinction between having an indigenous ancestor and belonging to an indigenous nation. As Gawenahere Davery Jacobs, a young uh, Ghanaian Kehaka activist who was born in Ganawage and grew up here in New York City, points out. The question of identity is central to who we are as indigenous peoples. Who is your family? Where do you come from? Asking these types of questions is common when meeting each other to establish our kinship ties. <clears throat> Thank you, Squinis. Indeed, our origins can be traced back centuries and across thousands of kilometers to our territory. It's a testament of our strength and inter-community ties. To pretend otherwise, as the so-called Abenaki tribes of Vermont do, is to traffic in misinformation. 
The history of indigenous peoples is marked by theft. Lands, knowledge, opportunities, languages, and technologies have been stolen from us. The type of identity theft we are discussing here is part of a global context of persecution of indigenous peoples that includes sterilization and even murder, often to access our lands. The phenomenon of stealing our identity sometimes seems to be a cynical ploy towards some kind of pro-indigenous political agenda. As Professor Daryl LaRue demonstrates quite convincingly in his research into the explosions of groups claiming to be indigenous in eastern Ontario, Quebec, the Maritimes, and parts of New England. However, very often, the astro astronomical growth of new claims to indigeneity can be clearly attributed to white supremacy in opposition to our indigenous treaty and treaty rights. The dissonance is strong in the face of pretendians who, in an absurd reveal, present themselves as more authentically indigenous than us, denying our lived experience. Today, we have presented the case of several thousands Americans in Vermont who are stealing our identity by inventing traditions, accessing funds reserved for indigenous peoples, defiling our graves, giving themselves the right to speak as experts about our history, violating our sovereignty, and perpetrating the colonization of our people and our lands. We welcome these peoples into our homes, sharing with them certain ancestral knowledge and our language out of our own generosity and openness. Yet, they have appropriated these teachings, commercialized them, and are now rewriting our history, claiming to carry the truth, even though they are not indigenous. But our presentation is also a warning to all indigenous peoples. The infringements of rights we suffer today could become reality tomorrow if we don't join forces. Identity fraud threatens the integrity of our cultures and traditions, distorting our age-old heritage. While culture is naturally din dynamic, the theft of our identity is not cultural. It is the result of a settler culture intent on destroying indigenous peoples. Our recognitions of identity and culture, inspired by exchanges with other indigenous peoples, is legitimate and necessary, unlike theft and or appreciation, appropriation by outside groups. Our nation's capacity for self-determination is being eroded by this theft of identity and invention of culture, violating the principles set in our Articles 3 and 4 of the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. How can the Wabanaki Nation claim self-determination, autonomy, and self-governments when our fundamental rights are constantly being trampled underfoot by individuals and groups pretending to be us? The answer is clear. We must anticipate and counter this trend to preserve the essence of our identity and sovereignty. Thank you. Oleone. Tilone, Siguanis, Isaac. Thank you for that, the, your presentation. And I hope now that you all have a better understanding of this, uh, the identity fraud issues that has caused to our nation and especially to our youth. So I will now open the floor for questions. Uh, so anybody who has questions, so raise your hand and we'll call you on the mic. Bonjour, Annie. Je vous remercie de vous dire que vous avez été en train de vous dire que vous avez été en train de vous dire que vous My name is Taylor. I'm from Manitoba, uh, Broken Head Ojibwe Nation specifically. Um, and I would like to address what you had shared at the very beginning, being someone who attended that early morning um, presentation and how violated I feel for being a part of that now and posting photos, and I'm gonna get emotional. Um, because this isn't something to take lightly, it's something that we all experience from coast to coast to coast and all four directions across Turtle Island especially. Um, 
and coming from a family of day schoolers and residential school survivors and having lost and having to reclaim and restore my connection to culture and seeing how easy these pretendians get it as opposed to how hard I have to work to get it is just something that's just completely just disheartening to be to have to see that and so I sit here with a youth from Brokenhead as well who I asked to join me here on this trip to experience something that you know we don't always have the opportunity to do and bringing her to that session that we just came from and how terrible I feel to have put her through that is just awful and so I just want to say thank you and especially to the youth who presented on your courage and your bravery and your resilience to share this type of knowledge with everybody and so though it's not so much a question rather a comment but I would like to maybe ask like how do what are other ways that you are addressing this as Abenaki people is there do you support self-declaration do you support proof of identity and things like that too because this is something that we're seeing more and more often um, with other groups of people from I don't want to cause too much controversy and kind of call out a group of people that we see a lot of happening in Manitoba now um, but maybe some of you know who are from from Canada huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I just wanted to just say Chimi and thank you for sharing this because it's it's ignited a fire inside of me of, of what I just came from and where I'm sitting right now and so I just wanted to say that thanks for that comment yeah I open the floor for questions but any comments are welcome so thank you for your for sharing this. I'll let uh, Chief uh, Rick Obama someone answer your question Um, do we support it? I support the fact that we should have the right to do it ourselves. That no other government has the right to claim who, who our nation is. I think Prime Minister Trudeau said it best when he said, when he spoke of self-recognition and he said, when everyone's an Indian, no one is. And I think that's something we should keep in mind. So self-recognition can be very, very dangerous. I think our nations have to have the right to recognize our own people. Something that we didn't mention, in my nation, my nation has dwindled down through years. We have roughly 3,200 members left in my nation. This nation that pretends who they are, they have over 5,000. Their groups are outnumbering our own people. Does self-recognition work? No, it really doesn't. I know we all thought that, you know, when the UN Declaration came out and said self-recognition would be a good ideal, I think they forgot to mention who has to recognize you to be self-recognized. I'm fine with someone saying, you know, that they, who are, they are who they are. I don't have the right to say they're not. But I really have the right to say something when you've stolen my language and you stole my culture and you stole my way of life and you say it's yours. As First Nations people, we were always sharing people, no doubt about it. We shared our culture, we shared our language, we shared our way of life. If one took this and started to feed their family with it, we didn't have a problem with that. But when one took it and said it was theirs and forgot about us, that's where the problem comes in. So does self-recognition work? Not in the fullest. It only works if the people themselves recognize you and make it very clear. It has to be the people of the nation that they speak of. Not just... In, in the United States, what happened was they took literally what the Declaration said. You must be recognized. Self-recognition can be recognized by the people. So five people stood up and said, I self-recognize myself as an Abenaki. And these four people recognized me. The next one stood up and said, I recognize myself as an Abenaki. And these four people recognized me. So I think the UN Declaration needs to be very, very clear on who the people are. And, or who the organization, or they have a word for it. What was the word they used actually in the Declaration? Uh, organizations or groups? No. You know, what is an organization? 
How can an organization recognize someone belongs to my nation or to any one of your nations? Or these new nations that they create, as you spoke of, <laughs> out your way. <laughs> you know, so I think these, there's a lot of work. I think that when self-recognition came out and it, it, it sounded like a really good ideal, but it really isn't, okay? It, it really isn't. So it's hard for me to support it, even though that I know that sitting at a table with a lot of chiefs supported it and thought, yes, you know, self-recognition is a good ideal. But I saw self-recognition almost just destroy my community and destroy my nation. So I hope that answered your question. Okay. If I, if I could add, and first of all, I want to thank you for your comment and uh, especially acknowledging our youth. And uh, uh, I think back 20 years ago, uh, I've heard a, a comment that was common to many people that the Wabanaki language is going to be extinct in a matter of a, a few years. So I think uh, our youth here are proving uh, those people wrong, and, uh, and that's uh, the beauty of their presence here. Uh, I represent a regional organization, uh, never claim to be, uh, never claiming to be a government because we're not, and we will not ever be a government. Uh, that status really belongs to uh, Chief Obamsawin and his colleagues from our table. But nevertheless, we're a forum where these type of issues uh, uh, come and we have to deal with them. And, uh, and to me, uh, I know the UN doesn't really have a clear definition as to who is indigenous and who is not. And we have uh, in the room, I see uh, Clem and Arma and we have drafters of the UN Declaration, and Article 33 speaks to that issue. I think that's the only article within the Declaration. But even there, and as referred to by Chief Obamsawin, there's, you know, the, the, the privilege of self-identifying as an indigenous person. Uh, ultimately, it says also that uh, uh, we have, we should have our own institutions uh, confirmed identity for any individual. So, you know, it's maybe there needs to be a clear definition as to who is and who is not. But for the time being, and I've heard this from Chief Obamso and others at our table is, you know, uh, and I get messages every, every so often, people saying, well, you know, my great-grandfather or great-grandmother was from this nation. Uh, what do I do to, you know, uh, gain my status or gain that recognition? I say, well, it doesn't belong to me. You have, you claim to be a member of that nation or any particular nation, you go to, you go to that nation because ultimately they're the ones who will decide whether you can, you know, get, get, get the status of being a member of that nation. Thank you. Um, I have six people requesting. Uh, first, I'll let uh, the gentleman speak, and then after, Chief uh, McKenzie. My name is Ande Sombi, and I'm uh, the chair of the Sami and Indigenous Law um, Research Group at the Faculty of Law in, at the Norwegian Arctic University in, in Tromsø. And, and we have um, some parallel uh, issues, uh, for example, now a burning issue with Finland. And uh, uh, Finland has been found um, to be in violation with uh, Article 25 in the Convention on Civil and Political Rights. Uh, and the reason why they were found in violation was that they uh, accepted uh, um, about 70 non-Sami people to be registered into the role uh, of the Finnish Sami parliament. Uh, I have, um, uh, for those uh, interested, I have uh, uh, tried to structure uh, this uh, in, a, in a video where I metaphorized this, uh, this meeting about uh, the prey, uh, prey culture and, and a predator culture and how a predator culture uh, um, t takes different layers of a prey culture. 
and, and one of the uh, layers uh, can be that the, the predator culture eats uh, the, the colors of the, of the culture or, or uh, they can eat, the pro as mentioned uh, here, the problems of the culture. Uh, so that, for example, as we see it in the Sami context that uh, there are um, Norwegian researchers who are analyzing the, the problems that the Sami um, community and have had during the, 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 the processes where, where our culture were, cultures were attacked. And then we, of course, have, have these more e hard economic uh, um, parts with, with resources and so on. So uh, if you are uh, interested to, to look into the structure, then you can Google the prey culture and predator culture. Thank you for that comment, sir. Thank you. Uh, Chief McKenzie? I said, thanks for giving me new, uh, new functions. I'm not chief at all. I'm, I'm just me, myself, and I. <laughs> um, yeah, well, actually, uh, the chief, uh, Picard, uh, gave me the opportunity to discuss about that. And uh, Andy, you will be able to testify about that as well. When we wrote this uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, this, uh, the articles, every commas, dotted lines or whatnot were negotiated, discussed within the caucus, the indigenous caucus, but also with the member states. And you have to bear in mind, back in the days, back in the days, uh, in the 80s, we were confronted with a, a situation whereby indigenous peoples were not recognized at all. There were indigenous populations or minorities, or there were no indigenous tribes in, in member states, in many member states. I think about Russia, for instance. I think about uh, India. I think about places uh, uh, elsewhere in, the, uh, in Ukraine, like uh, Crimea, Tatar. They were, you know, they were not uh, recognized at all. And especially, we were, in the 80s, the con context of the, uh, the geopolitical context in Latin America was very difficult for indigenous groups and peoples. They were facing military actions against them, disappearances, people were disappeared, uh, leaders were disappeared or murdered basically because of identifying themselves as indigenous peoples or indigenous citizens. So this is why it's there, this, uh, this article which is now, you know, problematic for, for uh, a lot of, uh, of our groups. And so that explains the history, where it's coming from, this, and, uh, and the challenges now we, we're now facing, and the fact that uh, in certain uh, social liberal states, such as Canada, well, they want to promote reconciliation, they want to promote openness to indigenous peoples and cultures. In the Canadian Constitution, we refer as, uh, in search section 35, the, we recognize indigenous peoples meaning Indians, Inuit, and Métis, okay? And of course, some will say, well, I'm a Métis, not only from the, the Red River, but from Ontario, and you have decisions from the Supreme Court of Canada recognizing uh, rights to, to, to these people. Uh, like the Pauli decisions, for instance, and I, I believe that there was another one recently. Uh, so it's a difficulty, it's a challenge, but also where does it stop, right? You know, uh, uh, do we have to quantify the, the, the blood quantum we have in each and every one of us or what not? My name is Mackenzie, and you called me Chief Mackenzie, but because I'm Scottish, part Scottish, and I'm very proud of my Scottish ancestry. Of course, I would not go back to Scotland and claim and say, could I, could I have a Scottish passport, you know? Although it doesn't exist, but still, I would support their, their independence <laughs> or their right to self-determination. So that's where it's coming from. So it's problematic, and of course, uh, we have our neighbors. I'm from, I'm from uh, despite my accent, I'm, I'm from Labrador, and, uh, and uh, I know these people that are 
seeking recognition, the, the Nunatuka Book uh, Community Council, which is, uh, they, they take pride of, uh, of their Inuit heritage, so, but uh, where does it stop, you know, where, there's a, there's a fine line between uh, tolerance uh, and exclusion. Uh, and with, we are in the United Nations, we, we talk about recognition of peoples and, and openness and human rights. So, and just, you know, Daniel said, that's a very good presentation that you, that you bring in. But in the international human rights forum, you know, what do we do? How do we do, address this? You know, can we just, can, do we just outcast these people or not? And where's, there's a thin uh, thread, thin thread, if I say a fine line, whereby we have to consider our different angles as well as uh, human rights uh, advocates. Uh, voila, c'est tout ce que j'avais à dire, c'est tout ce que vous know, and I'm very happy to see my friend Andy here. Huh? Good. Many years, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you went away. Chief? I will agree with you. Okay. There it is again. <laughs> Red means stop, okay? <laughs> You know, I agree with you that it's it's a real problematic thing. I mean, there is no doubt about it through the hardship of our people and different times, many of our people might have got lost or fell behind. So yes, it is very, very, you know, it, it is a challenging thing. But at the same time, we must also remember that there's a big, big difference between ancestry, blood, and who we are. If I date my family back 400 years and say my family married one native person and within that 400 years they were completely married out well I have a saying that I always say and I always get in trouble for it but I'll say it anyways mm -hmm. I can only water down a glass of milk so much before it's a glass of water so yeah it is a definitely a challenging thing but I think it's our nation's right, it's our God-given right to know who our people are and us to say who our people are. Keeping in mind that our nations had many times had adopted people and we should still have that right. But it should be our right. In our case, the government of Vermont seems to think it's his right to say who belongs to this new nation that he created. You have to understand what's happened to one of my nation in Vermont is not only has he created a new nation, he's erased mine. He's completely erased my history. He literally tells me I'm not allowed to sit at the table. I'm not even allowed at the Native Commission anymore to, to speak. I have no rights because I'm a Canadian Indian, is what he calls me. Well, there was no border. My people didn't never left the United States. We were never there. We never came to Canada because we were never there. We were part of North America. So yeah, although I agree with you that it was a, you know, it, it's a challenging thing, but it still boils down to whose right is it? It's, it's our God-given right as nations to know who our people are, or to at least say who our people are. If our nations wish to adopt people, that's fine. That's up to them. It's not up to some foreign government to say so, or to tell us who we are or who we're not. It's not up to some foreign government to give the remains of my ancestors to someone else, for they can put them in their museums. My people don't have out of respect, they should not be in a museum. They should be reburied. They should be put where they, where they were to rest. So yeah, I agree that when these, you know, that Native people weren't part of the UN Declaration, we weren't part of anything. We weren't even looked at as anything at one time. I agree, but it doesn't mean swing the pendulum so far the other way that anyone has to say to say who they are. Thank you. Uh, Will Ewan? No, the Leo is Leah Nicholas. Willis the Gwewin Ognila Naganujia Onil Nagud Cook. My name is Leah Nicholas McKenzie. I'm Willis the Gwey. We're members of the Wabanaki Confederacy, so we're cousins. <laughs> um, I'm a member of the Nicholas family on my father's side and my, the Bear family on my mother's side from Tobik, or in a good cook. 
And um, I am really happy that you're having this side event. I think it's incredibly important. This topic is very, very top of mind uh, in Canada, but obviously in the United States as well. And when I sit in that other room, in conference room four, I'm hearing some things that trouble me very greatly. And um, I, what I'm feeling is that there's a fundamental misunderstanding of who the peoples are to whom this declaration refers. This declaration focuses on both individual and collective rights, uh, yet it only mentions individuals in very rare cases. It talks about the elders, it talks about women. Um, so you know that any other time they're talking about the collective rights of our peoples. But I, I'm hearing this fundamental misunderstanding of collect collective rights. I'm hearing a fundamental misunderstanding of self-determination. Um, and it's I, what I think is that we need more human rights education. Um, and when it comes to the issue of whether or not we need a definition, of course, Indigenous peoples globally have fought against a definition for a very long time. But there are, culture, there are um, accepted characteristics, globally accepted characteristics, of who Indigenous peoples are. And so if there, I hear a non-governmental organization in there say, I have the right, uh, I have the right to self-determination, then show me where you, how you match up against those characteristics. And don't quote to me Articles 18 and 19 of this declaration. Those apply to peoples, not to individuals, not to organizations. Um, I, and I think we do need to have this education because we're going into another round of enhanced participation discussions, which need to be and should be solely focused on the voices of nations. And so I really do thank you and, and appreciate uh, this day today. It's no, comment, no question, just a comment. Thank you, my cousin. Uh, I have the lady and then uh, Mr. Shachi after. Uh, hi. It, it. Um, hello, fellow indigenous uh, rights advocates. This is not much of a question. I am Rorilin Bayao from Atamanobo of Talaingo Davao del Norte, Philippines. And I'm also a member of um, Mindanao Indigenous People's Youth Organization in the Philippines also. Um, I was a victim of exploitation and violation of extremist group. For the longest time, the indigenous peoples were confronted by discrimination, particularly on access to uh, social services and prospect within the economy and politics. There are also issues of forced relocation and loss of the lands. Mostly, the indigenous youth are the most affected. Hence, when the communist uh, CPP and PNDF or the communist uh, Party of the Philippines, New People's Army, National Democratic Front of the uh, Philippines promise us education and reform. We accept the offer of lucid to the fact that they groomed, manipulated, and coerced us into activities that serve their violent purposes. They exp uh, these experiences coupled with the renewed focus on the IPs or indigenous peoples to address uh, the said issues push me to per uh, perse uh, persevere furthered my resolve to advocate for the rights and the empowerment of the indigenous people's youth in the Philippines. However, the renewed effort of indigenous peoples has, has been uh, taken advantage by the sum to exploit the benefit gains for the IP members. For instance, there were the issues of identified fraud, which involves the unauthorized use of personal information and tribal affiliations for fi uh, financial gains and to the opportunities that reserve for the indigenous people. The identified thieves possess a significant threat to our culture, identity, and self-determination. When this happens, it under, un, uh, undermines our sense of self and distorts our collective past and narrative. This also deprives us, particularly the indigenous people's members, of our entit entitlement to the, uh, to the opportunity. Thank you. I apologize, Mr. Shashi. I had a uh, grand chief of the uh, Nation Army of in Quebec. Koi Miigwech, Koi Kakadas, Spana McGregor, and Indigenous Cause. 
Kitaganzi Bi and Donjaba. Um, I'm Savannah McGregor, Grand Chief of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg Nation Tribal Council, and I'm the spokesperson of seven of the 11 Anishinaabe Algonquin communities. I just want to put this on the record that, well, it goes without saying, we are we stand in total solidarity with you, Miigwech, for starting this with the drum and your songs. Um, it really brings your heartbeat and your jurisdiction over your own identities here into the United Nations for you to stand up for those future generations in collaboration together with, with our older generations and our youth and, and, and those to come. We face the same things, well, across the board and enough is enough. And I just hope, well, our communities are in crisis. Um, we're chronically underfunded. The world is changing so fast. So many things are showing up at our doors, be it wildfires, be it suicides, be it the opioid crises and whatever else that may come in the future, we don't know and we always have to be prepared. I just hope that one day there'll be some sort of redress um, so then we can stop having to find the resources to fight all of this and, and, and having, having to take the time out of other things that are prioritized, that should be more prioritized and focused on instead of having to spread ourselves out thin. So I'm, I'm here um, to stand in support of, of you and, and every other nation across not only Turtle Island, but the world. And, and it is together that we have to do it. We can't do it alone. And I'm just grateful to be here. It's my first experience um, at the United Nations and hopefully it won't be my last, but kichi miigwech. Ambassador Chartier. Yeah, th thank you. It is a, a topic that <laughs> could take several days, you know, to, to address. But I want to thank uh, Chief Obomsu and, and uh, the youth for making the bold step in bringing this discussion here, especially in, in the cradle, so to speak, of human rights. And our ma has reminded us that people individuals and maybe collectives of individuals also have, I guess, uh, the right to, to express themselves. Uh, and and that, that's a tough thing because uh, sometimes we view them as express, expressing themselves wrongly and infringing on, on us. Uh, so it is a tough road to walk. So I want to say I'm Clem or Clima Chartier. I'm the ambassador for the Manitoba Métis Federation, the national government of the Red River Métis. Uh, the Red River Métis, of course, also meaning the historic Métis Nation in Western Canada, the sole and legitimate representative of the historic Métis Nation. I've been involved in our own movement since the mid-60s, late 60s, and in the UN since uh, about 1974, and this is a, an issue that I think has, has been the most troublesome. Back at home, beginning in the 60s, we finally started as Métis getting a few programs and services, a bit of education, a bit of housing from the provincial government, a little bit from the feds. And then all of a sudden you had these people coming forward who we know are white people saying they're Métis to get a, an advantage. And, and it just has continued growing. Now it's grown to the f situation where there's groups of people that call themselves Métis because maybe people don't understand who the Métis are. We're a distinct people, a distinct nation with our own language, culture, territory, population, symbols like our, our flags and our, our music, our dance. And when the word Métis was used historically, Everybody knew it was the Métis Nation in Western Canada, those people. Canada knew as well because when they went to war with the Métis, they didn't go east. They didn't stop in Ontario. They came to the Red River, then they came to Batoche. We fought Canada 
you know, twice. They hanged our leader. So they know who we are. But now, with the Constitution in 1982 using the term Métis, people are taking that and they're taking the dictionary or literal definition of mixed. And that's not what Métis is. That's not what the historic Métis nation is. We're a distinct people. And so, and the example was raised of the Nanutukavut Community Council. After 1982, after patriation, after recognition of the Métis, they got together and decided because probably they do have long-time ancestry. You know, I don't think we, I can dispute that. But they came together and called themselves the Métis Nation of Labrador, as in the late 80s. Then, over a decade or so later, they said, well, no, no, we're not Métis, and we're not going to get anything as Métis. So they called themselves the Inuit of Southern Labrador, the Nunatukovot Community Council. So they're appropriating. First they appropriated who we were, and then now they're appropriating you know, Inuit and also claiming Inu lands. It's a big issue. So that's just one example. And I know well, I could go into more, but I just want to say this, uh, just an announcement. The chiefs of Ontario, who are having a, a hard struggle right now, and the Manitoba Métis Federation, we are co-hosting an Indigenous Leaders Summit on Indigenous Identity Fraud, May 14th and 15th in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Uh, it's for leaders only. It's by invitation to leaders, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis Nation leaders, Red River Métis leaders. But it will be live streamed for anybody out there that wants to watch it. And more information will come up so you will know where, where to, what channel to turn to. I'm not a tech, tech person, but it'll be there. And if you want to hear more about Indigenous identity fraud and theft in Canada, that will be a forum where Inuit leaders, First Nations leaders, and Red River Métis leaders will be speaking on this issue. Thank you. Any more comments or questions? Good afternoon, everyone. Tanche. Um, Margaret Frodishna Koshan. Um, I, I am actually uh, the president of the Métis Nation of Ontario. I'm a member of the Board of Governors of the Métis National Council. Uh, and I wanted to acknowledge, uh, I'll start by acknowledging the Abenaki welcome song uh, and the drum. Thank you, Marci, for, for bringing that. Uh, and as well as the leadership, Chief Abonsuan, and, and in particular your youth leaders, uh, Isaac and... Uh, Squanis, um, thank you for bringing that youth perspective forward. I think that's really, uh, really important. I'm honored to be here today with Jordi Plain, who's one of our youth leaders as well. Uh, and I've been very happy to see the extent to which nations have been bringing young leaders forward to this forum in particular. Um, and in particular, I wanted to say to all those youth that are standing with each other on the floor of the forum, that's an incredibly uh, strong show of strength and determination, and I'm happy to see the youth working so well together. So merci for, for all of that work and bringing those perspectives forward, and for sharing the story about what has happened uh, and what continues to happen with the Abenaki, and, and the, the work of some to claim an identity that is not their own, in large part to undermine Abenaki rights. This is something that is deeply concerning to us, and in fact, we hosted a forum in November of 2018 to talk about this very issue. We invited Professor LaRue to come in and speak to his book, which was about to come out and promote it at that event. Uh, and I think it's, it, this is an issue that we are all very much concerned about. Um, and I think we need to continue to raise, raise those concerns about it. It, it is absolutely an issue for the Métis Nation, um, and um, you know we've se we've seen those in Quebec, those in the Maritimes, claiming Métis identity, often as a means to undermine Abenaki rights, undermine Cree rights, um, and that is something that I think we need to continue to we need to continue to do that work. Ultimately, it is up to the nation to decide. That's a very important principle. That is part of our inherent rights of self-determination, of self-government. Uh, and I, I, 
I did want to uh, just reference, I know, uh, Mr. McKenzie, thank you for bringing some of that history forward and why the language that's, that we have is there. Um, and and uh, there was a reference there to the Pauli case as well. And I wanted to just, uh, we, we've historically been known in Canada as the forgotten people. There's many who still don't know our stories. I wanted to acknowledge Clem actually for him and all of our leaders that have done the work to be present here, part of that Indigenous Peoples Caucus, part of the work that's brought us the UN Declaration and the tools that we have in our toolboxes now in order to address this work. But for those that are from different parts parts of the world that may not know. Uh, the Métis were never recognized in Canada until 1982 when we were included as one of the three Aboriginal peoples of Canada, Métis, First Nations and, and Inuit. And our people pushed long and hard to have that, uh, an articulation of that, what that meant, our right to self-determination recognized through our, the constitutional conferences that followed the, the creation of the repatriation of the Constitution. And um, while there were many strong efforts made, we were not successful in that. We were not successful because governments, we, we could get only so far and governments would essentially pull the opportunity um, from, from under, our, under our feet. And it actually took us, we weren't able to negotiate that recognition. It took us taking a case all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada before there was finally recognition of Métis rights in this country. And that, in fact, was the Pali case, as Mr. McKenzie referenced. That was a case that was brought forward by the Métis Nation of Ontario and on behalf of the entire Métis Nation. Uh, and we were, we were finally successful. But what the court heard in that case was a story about a community that had been a Métis community that had been asserting itself as a Métis community since the early 1800s, um, standing up alongside First Nations um, in protection of the land, petitioning the crown, seeking redress, recognition, and respect for rights. Um, and, and that, of course, never happened. Um, and it was the descendants of those people that wrote those petitions that were, in fact, the, those were the Pauli's, those were the people that were the, the folks that, that uh, the plaintiffs that took that case forward. And I think it's important for people to, it's important for people to understand um, all that history, and that's, that's the challenge that we have, and I don't think it's Métis alone. I think many Canadians, many people within the countries that you all represent don't know the story of our nations. They've not, never been told in our voice. They're told in somebody else's voice, right? Um, and so we continue to do that work, um, and in fact, the Métis Nation of Ontario has been a part of that work, um, including some of the modern, uh, the contemporary assertions that, that Clem just referenced since the 1960s. Um, and those, in fact, are the people that we represent within the Métis Nation of Ontario, as well as people like myself. Um, my Métis ancestry is largely from the Red River Valley area. Um, we represent rights-bearing Métis people who descend from historic communities in Ontario that have been in existence since the early 1800s, as well as people like myself, people from the broader Métis Nation west of Ontario who now live in Ontario. But I wanted to, um, and, and I wanted to just acknowledge uh, Clem as well. He, was, he, he stood at the Supreme Court of Canada and made those arguments in, in Pauli, saying that you must recognize Métis rights and, and as well acknowledging the Pauli community, that Upper Great Lakes Métis community is part of the Métis Nation, full stop. Um, we've had some incredible leaders that have done that work for us in the past. We have some incredible young leaders today that know their stories, that are grounded in their history and their culture, uh, and that I think are, are going to be taking us well into the future. Uh, I just wanted to come back to that principle. It is up to the nation to decide. And that's something I think we can all agree to, uh, and we can all stand together. Um, I will, though, say, we are still the forgotten people in many respects. There's a lot of education that needs to be done. We actually need, I think, to talk to each other, listen to each other's stories, and go from there. And I will once again extend the hand, um, a, a hand, an open door to have those conversations, Grand Chief Picard, Chief Abonswen, and any other leaders that are here um, to do that so that we can actually share those stories and we can speak from a place of knowledge. Um, on an issue that is, as I said, incredibly important. So I wanted to, again, thank Chief Obonswin, uh, Isaac Squanis, 
for bringing this perspective forward, telling the story, because what, what is happening to the Abenaki is happening elsewhere, and it is absolutely something that we must stand against. Marcy. Uh, Salut tout le monde. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dani Lanouette. I'm a member of the Chippewas of Newash and Cedar First Nation um, through my mother. And uh, my father is from Rapid Lake in Quebec. We also have ties to Kitagon Zibi. My parents are Jerry Lanouette and Wendy Lanouette. Um, and yeah, I just first want to acknowledge the youth leaders, Siguanis and Isaac, for um, coming and speaking. I know that this can be a really... Um, how do you say that, like, kind of uh, like an anxiety kind of feeling to speak about, especially when there are so many, you know, older folks who are very strong in their belief that they are Native and they're not. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, as someone who is, my father is a member of the Algonquin Nation, but who isn't by my own membership, um, I've watched the Algonquins of Ontario cause direct harm to our communities, um, not only at a community and nation level, but at a personal level as well. Um, I was born and raised in Ottawa. I live in uh, Regina on Treaty 4 lands now at the First Nations. I go to the First Nations University. And um, we even have people claiming to be Algonquin out there who grew up in Saskatchewan. Um, teaching at my school, which is really great. Um, <laughs> um, and so it is really nice to, uh, you know, come into these spaces and see that this is being called out. Um, having groups like Nunatukuvu, we ha like I, when I saw it on the side event list, I was like, how did they actually get in here? And so I think something that really needs to be addressed, and I don't know who in here has the power to do this um, or how this can be uh, talked about. But, you know, when we talk about self-determination, I think the thing that comes up first for me is the right to determine our own membership and our own kinship ties. And so when I see names like, like that one on the list, I really just wonder how we can actually keep our community safe because it's not only exploitation, it's, it's direct violence and harm. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I want to thank everyone who spoke today and um, the folks who offered the song. Um, yeah, it just, it felt like a bit of home. So, um, miigwech for, for your words and your bravery today. Any more questions or comments? Um, hi everyone, I'm Veronique Picard. I'm a youth representative for uh, the Assembly of First Nations in Canada. Um, thank you, Tia Wenke, Siguanis, and Isaac. Um, it, it is an issue that we are all facing, and my question for you after hearing all of this would be, um, in the context of the UN, uh, what process could the United Nations uh, follow to come up with a definition of what, is, what are Indigenous people at the international level? Thank you. I think the first process they could do just listen to First Nations people. I think that'd be step one. And to listen to us on saying who we want to be our people. Not to just what an organization says it is. So I think the first step is to listen to us. Although the UN Declaration has opened the door to First Nations people and we hear many, many promises and we hear many things of self-determination, self-government, self-recognition, self-everything. I think they really got to put it a lot more into practice. The words have been nice, but now things we need to see the action behind it. And we need to be brought to the table as a nation. We need to be brought to the table with a voice where they're listening to us, where we sit on the same, the same level as they do. 
because whether they like it or not, to each individual nation, we are a country within ourselves. And they need to view us that way, and they need to look at us that way. And until then, it's all words. Well, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, that question really belongs to the UN. I think it belongs to us. Yeah. Uh, and in a way, uh, and I think it can be very, uh, I acknowledge that it can be very, uh, it is very emotional, uh, but uh, it is very important as well. And, uh, and to me, we've heard that the debate has been ongoing for the last 40 years, since uh, 82 in Canada. Uh, 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 it's true for First Nations, it's true for the Métis, and now it's true for the Inuit as well. And, and uh, so there needs to be some qualifiers there in terms of, you know, how we engage uh, into that process within, within our nations and within ourselves. Um, I think it's very important as well to, to very distinguish one's claim to identity and any other associated claims. And I think that's where, you know, how the issue is being managed domestically has a lot of, uh, in my view, influence. And I spoke to Bill 53, and uh, at the same time, what I will add is, it's not so much a question of uh, questioning one's claim to identity. It's really uh, a question to what other claims are being associated with that. Uh, the other point is, uh, uh, and we have to draw a line between uh, what is what could be considered a legitimate claim and some of those, what I would call them extremists. In Quebec, we've had, for the past 30 years, uh, name of nations that were coming from somebody's dream that nations that we never heard of. And I think, you know, that clearly needs to be denounced. And we've done that over time, but, but yet these groups, and because of maybe it's become so easy to identify as, as, a, as a nation or a citizen of a nation, that it, it has become acceptable to come up with, you know, uh, a name, and I mean, we've seen that. So I think there needs to be, I think the clear answer to your question, to the question is, is really, I think before, you know, speaking of reconciliation broadly, let's speak about reconciliation within our nations. I think it's very key that we also have that in mind. Thank you. We'll take a one last comment or question, Mr. Chartier. Thank you for that opportunity. I know Margaret uh, did mention some things already, but I just want to supplement uh, the... Hello? Yeah, it's still not there. But anyway. Okay. Uh, actually, we were recognized, and, and Margaret is just doing shorthand, I think. Uh, we, our provisional government actually negotiated the Métis Nation in Western Canada in the Confederation in 1869-70. And the rights, at least for our children, were enshrined in the Manitoba Act, which is part of Canada's constitution. 1.4 million acres were to go to the children. But it never happened properly. And in 2013, the Supreme Court of Canada said that's still owed to the Métis. So we had that recognition. Following that, our rights were dealt with through a script process under the Dominion Lands Act where they gave us land allotments on the prairies where we lived and said, with that, your rights are extinguished. Okay, so we were recognized. And in terms of the Pauli case, important case for sure, but uh, people neglect to, to also mention that, and I'm a little bit of a lawyer, and I've been doing pro bono work in my community since about 1993 through the direction of the elders, because our people have no money for lawyers. And we've won in my part of northwest Saskatchewan, uh, hunting and fishing rights upheld in 1997 in the Court of King's Bench, 
where our people to this day can hunt and fish like the status Indians or the treaty Indians in that area. In fact, the Pauli was negative for us because since then, I've done about five more trials where they charge us every 25 miles. We've got to keep going because of the site-specific thing. So Pauli, yes, is good, but it's not the answer to, to everybody. We were doing quite well uh, on our own. Uh, you know. But anyway, I just wanted to say that so there's no misunderstanding of you know, what actually happened on the ground. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor LaRue wanted to add an, uh, another comment. Uh, for those who are interested in uh, next week's event in Vermont, um, you can come and chat with us. Um, you can also look on social media. Uh, it will be live streamed. So if you want to know more about, more details about the sort of uh, movement in um, Vermont around the sort of fake Abenaki tribes, um, that's happening next Thursday at 5.30 p.m. I also just want to I mention that um, I sort of take issue with um, the use of me at an event that the MNO organized, the Professor Fro said at that event, I was very clear that I oppose the Métis Nation of Ontario's new communities since 2017, which is the position that the Anishinaabe people have taken in Ontario. If you're interested in seeing research that demonstrates that, then just come and talk to me and I'll send you some links. Thank you. Thank you. So again, I would like to thank you all for attending our uh, side event today. So I wish you all the best and uh, see you soon. Thank you.